who's a researcher at the Centre for the Analysis of Social Media at Demos Think Tank. Elliot, thank you for coming on the podcast. Um, yeah, welcome to uh, Techno Social, <laughs> as we call it. I first kind of got turned on to your organisation. I read a book by uh, Jamie Bartlett, the, uh, the People vs. Tech, who, if I'm right, he was the director for the Centre for the Analysis. Yeah, so he was the director until Christmas, um, mm. and now he's got his own TV show, his own books, so he's a sort of senior fellow so he kind of pops in when things are interesting basically mm. you know, like he's on a zero hour contract <laughs> we say <laughs> <laughs> nice so uh so what do you do with the organization uh so i'm one of the researchers in chasm the center of analysis of social media um mm. i think i'm the only full-time researcher so right. I, I do a lot of the day-to-day -day research so writing the reports and stuff mm. basically along with uh, speaking doing this kind of stuff trying mm -hmm. to get our work out there yeah fantastic so what is the stuff that you really kind of focus on with your research uh so the two big projects I've been working on recently are one on like um, online disinformation. I think that's our, our main focus. That's mm. what we've been interested in for years and years and years mm. is looking at how states and not just states, but other actors try and influence things online, try and shape our information atmosphere. Because, you know, over the last decade or so, we've gone from like the iPhone being released to suddenly the internet making up just a massive part of our lives. Um, and mm. for a long time that we didn't really understand how that was affecting us, how that was affecting our democracy. And mm. in the last three or four years, it seems to have come to the forefront of everyone's imagination. Yeah. And so we're just trying to, I don't know, dispel some myths as well as like actually get some evidence about what's going on. Because I think there's a lot of people speculating, but mm. it's very difficult if you don't have the hard, the hard numbers, as it were. Yeah, sure. I and mean, what are some of the myths that you may be dispelling? So I think, I think the biggest one is this idea of like fake news. Mm. Like, obviously there are people saying like things that aren't true online, but that's true of everywhere. People, if you go down the pub, your mates are going to be like spouting a lot of stuff that isn't true, but that's not necessarily a new thing or a big thing. I think when we look to like influence operations by states or by like terrorist groups or other things, mostly what they're doing is either pushing things that are true, but they're amplifying a certain kind of truths. So say there's a story about a migrant like committing a criminal act. It might just be one migrant doing one thing. But these bots or these like trolls will amplify it and push it so it's a big, big story, mm. even when it's actually a really small part of the whole of what's going on. Oh. Yeah, there are there are sometimes where like I don't know a state actor will try and plant a story and push something that's actually not true. But mm. to us, that makes up like that's one tactic out of a huge spectrum of different things, and mm. often not very effective. Like mm. if you see something that's blatantly false, often people like will just call bullshit or just not believe it because they don't believe things that are true either. Whereas mm. if you if you just push sort of motion narratives, you sort of I don't know, stoke up the tension in on an online space. If you make Twitter, Twitter does it itself to some extent through the algorithms it, em it employs. Mm. But if you just make it a much more hostile space, that makes people disengage and only leaves the most extreme elements left without you ever having to lie or ever do anything that's untrue. Mm. And in, in a way, kind of like every good lie actually contains a kernel of truth. Yeah. Like it's very difficult to convince people of outright falsehoods. Mm -hmm. You need to have some kind of basis mm -hmm. and really... It, it's the interpretation that you want to push, not yeah. not some kind of material belief in the world. Yeah. Like, and I think the one, the one, the sometimes we have seen just like blatant falsehoods. It's not just one narrative; it's like twelve. So yeah. they'll push twelve different things that are untrue, and yeah. so you've got this huge spectrum of different narratives going on around, say, terrorist attacks or around like bombings, like what's going on, this kind of thing. If you make it just really chaotic, yeah. people don't know what to believe, and the truth gets lost as just one other story. Yeah. Oh, okay. But cool. that's kind of part of what's been going on as I kind of understand it, with with what the Russians have been doing, with mm -hmm. their sort of, um, is it the Internet Research Agency? Yeah. Is that the kind of Russian state-sponsored kind of, I don't even know exactly what to call it. Uh, I don't, I mean, some people call it like a troll farm. I think, yeah, yeah state, state-sponsored, like, online influence place. It's really annoying that it shortens to IRA, because it makes it quite <laughs> difficult to talk about in the British context. But yeah, it's, a, it's basically a, a building in St. Petersburg. They hire people on minimum wage to just go and post comments on the internet, like, all day. Mm. Like it's very, it's like like a call center, but but yeah. like trying to undermine democracy. Although there's an interesting effect with that because like, especially among a lot of the really radical sort of circles on the internet, 
especially if you look at, say, the alt-right, mm -hmm. calling someone a shill, as in someone who's paid to hold an opinion, is, like, that's just a common thing. Like, when yeah. someone disagrees with you, you call them a shill. And then, so it's kind of like, the fact that that is an existing thing, mm -hmm. it's out there, means all of a sudden that that kind of insult has a little bit of weight to it. Because it's like, you might actually be a shill. Like, mm -hmm. Because it's not, it's not like there's no evidence of people doing this. Mm -hmm. There are like Russians out there paying people to think stuff. And so in a way, just by even having it exist, it kind of contributes to like the chaos in the online space because it, it, it sort of adds in everyone's brain the idea that if you don't actually know who you're talking to, that you might be talking to someone who's paid to hold that opinion. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think, that, I think that's kind of true. I think to some extent, a lot of the problem that Russia and these other like Iran or Venezuela cause is not their own actions, but people accusing other people of working for these organizations. Mm. And that that kind of unlike that to some extent people buying into them being able to do this is what un does the damage, not their own actions themselves. It's just the narrative that this is happening. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I think that is a, a pretty big issue. Mm. So so if you've kind of said that um, fake news is almost a kind of like myth of an issue that's going like, what are the big issues that really Demos is looking at with your research to do with social media yeah. and online presence? So, um, I, I think in, in the realm of like information warfare, which is what the recent reports have been looking at, it's, mm. um, I think some of it's looking at like, what, uh, some of it's like how do, how do information gets blocked out. So have you heard of like hashtag poisoning? No. So this happened, I think we've got an example of like the Pena bots in Mexico, where what you would do is simply on a certain hashtag, just the, uh, what it, so there were lots of, there were hashtags used to report human rights abuses by the government. Mm. And what they would do is just spam loads of irrelevant content into these hashtags, completely block people out. So that when you tried to use it, it wasn't helpful at all. And so I think some of the action is like looking at what we think private companies and governments can do. Cause especially with online disinformation, it's a, a cross border issue. There mm. isn't like, I know there, well, Russia is trying to cut itself off. Russia is trying to create its own internet. But for the most part, the internet is a, is a global thing. And so governments have very little power, except maybe the American government to actually do much about this. So we're trying to see what can the platforms themselves do? How can, what can they implement? Like what kind of systems can they put in place to prevent this? Mm. But it's, it's very difficult because with the recent Christchurch shooting, you've seen see the video going around. <laughs> Facebook was trying to take it down, but it was getting uploaded hundreds of thousands of times a minute, basically. Mm. And that the only thing they could possibly have done was to stop, like to pre-screen everything, just like completely turn off your ability to instantly post things. And is that something we really want them to do? Is that something you want Facebook to be the ultimate arbiter of what goes up on their platforms? Mm. And that it never even hits the platform? And that is the kind of balance that this online disinformation is to some extent a product of being able to say whatever you want. And the counterbalance is either governments or these platforms being able to pre-screen everything and you don't even know what's not being said. So that's mm. what we're trying to look at and we haven't got all the answers yet, but that's mm. the ultimate aim of the research program. I think. It's like we're in such a difficult situation because we've never had anything like this before, right? And even with something like the Christchurch shooting, there's this real kind of like viral network effect in that people want to share content, even if it's horrific content. There's a kind of like, I mean, I, I've certainly shared links to things that then I've thought afterwards, why, why the fuck am I sharing a link to that? It's, <laughs> it's, it's bizarre. And how much can we regulate that? I don't know, I'm kind of thinking out loud here yeah. rather than directly putting that to you. Um, Would you say that it's a free speech issue? Would you say that it's like that it is a question of sort of to what extent people should be allowed to speak freely in a sort of online and anonymous space? Because I would say that like as someone who sort of goes to a lot of places because I find them quite interesting that a lot of this sort of disinformation and controversy has, in, has originated in a lot of ways. Um, like, when you when you don't know who you're talking to on the internet, there is no practical difference between serious speech and sarcasm. Mm -hmm. Like, you can never really tell if someone is putting forward an opinion or an idea simply to get a reaction or because it's what they actually believe. And so this, the way you speak on the internet is qualitatively different to the way you speak in real life because you know you're not being judged by anyone, especially if you're, you know in a place that's either anonymous or just talking to someone on Twitter who lives in another country to you. So is it, is it a free speech issue? Is it, is it, does it, does it involve our rights? Uh, 
I think it it does in some circumstances. There are areas around like extreme Islamophobia or hate speech or incitement to violence where I think it is, is a free speech issue, mm-hmm. where there is just directly illegal content that I think most of us can agree is is just actively dangerous. Um, mm-hmm. Where you might want to say if if like people on eight chan are saying like I- ironically or not, it doesn't really matter if you're calling for certain people to be killed. Mm. Then that's an area where you might say we need to regulate people's free speech. But I think to some extent it's more about in indivi- like individuals taking ownership for what they read online and like I, a lot of what we think is that there's the there are underlying social issues that it is it is something we've never seen before. It is mm. this massive communication space, but these kind of things wouldn't have the same effect if there weren't already underlying problems in society that they could kind of dig their dig their fingers into that pull apart. Mm. And that there are these underlying tensions around like immigration or around the economy, around other things that these platforms are amplifying. But that, but as you say, it's, it's some extent is we don't want to restrict people's free speech. So we mm. need to go to the root of some of these issues to look at the underlying social tensions, whether they're offline or on- online. Because these same conversations happen not just on on Facebook, but in offices, in in pubs, in other places. Mm. And so I think yeah, focusing too much on the free speech angle is both to some extent leaning into authoritarian places you don't want to go. And also just unhelpful because it might not even solve the problem. Mm-hmm. So I think one of the big issues at the moment is about how social media has been influencing politics, right? And, you know, we've seen that with discussion of the 2016 Donald Trump presidential election. We've seen it with discussions of, uh, of Brexit and sort of to what extent social media data is being used to target users and generate content. Um, have you kind of looked at that in your work with uh, your research? Okay, so I, I haven't directly worked on this, but we mm. published a piece on the future of political campaigning with the Information Commissioner's Office mm. about was it nine months ago that kind of looked at this. And yeah, uh, it is it is as you say with the with the uh, the Donald Trump campaign, but it is like the Vote Leave campaign. The Labour Party does it too. It's across the whole political spectrum. It isn't one side or the other using this. Um, and but yeah, we have so much data about us out in the world. Um, so. I think the most obvious is the stuff we post on social media, but a lot of it say like location data. So we being like, if you go on your Google Maps, you can see a timeline that shows where you've been for the last however many years because it's tracking where you are basically mm. all the time. And that this is, uh, have you heard of these data exchanges? Um, could you explain what that is? So um, we we see these big platforms like Facebook or Twitter or other places, but there are these sort of like more hidden companies that are sort of mm. aggregating everyone's data together. Mm. That when you install like a, I don't know, Farm, well not Farmville, but some like games like that on your phone, they mm. have lots of like, you click all these permissions and say, oh, you can you can use my location, you can look at all these other things. And these games sell this data on to these data exchanges. These data exchanges pool all the information about you, create a big sort of shadow profile of you, and use that to create like lookalike audiences so that they can... Because this, well, this comes from advertising, that it didn't start in politics. Mm. And politics is kind of a sideshow for a lot of these companies. That mm. the, real, the real money is in selling you, like, fluffy toys, or selling you, um, like, a phone case you don't really need. That that's what the real money is. And that politics is more like a way of showing off for a lot of these companies. Mm. That they can, they can influence elections, but that's not where they target it. But it's really come to the forefront in these last couple of years, yeah. Um, so, like, is it possible right now for someone who is not very tech literate and for someone who's you know just got a smartphone because everyone has a smartphone and they just download like random games to just play mm-hmm. on the tube and they you know just actual engagement with any of the complexity of technology is not a big part of their life yeah. is it feasible for such a person to have any control over how much data about them is available to all of these companies um I mean, there, there, are, there are some, like, you can install ad blockers, you can use a VPN. Neither of these are actually, like, very technically complicated. You just sign up to a service for a lot of mm. these. That It has been very much simplified. But it, it is quite difficult because they can build up shadow profiles. So, mm. like, imagine you've got a piece of paper and you cut out a person-shaped piece on that piece of paper. You can still see what the person looks like. And that is to some extent what happens with these kind of things, where even very technical people, if they try and hide themselves from these companies, they can still build up a sort of looking around where the gaps are. Because your friends will talk about you, your friends will take pictures yeah. of you. Look, uh, have you have you ever used Facebook where it says, "Oh, you might be in this picture"? Like it's not yeah. even yeah, that it, it knows what you look like, and it, you don't even need a Facebook profile for it to know what you look like. That it can build up and 
sort of image of you from all the other things that go on. Yeah. And this actually happens in genetic data too. You know, 23 and Me. Mm. That if any of your relatives have ever got like genetically tested and they have their profile, you can also be found through that as well because yeah. you are quite similar to that. And they found the they found the Sunshine State killer yeah, using yeah. that using like using DNA from like 30 years ago and mm-hmm. then like. DNA registries, and not knowing anyone who is even closely related to him, but just finding a whole bunch of people and then being like, oh, who could be related to all these different ones? Yeah. And then, yeah, in the same way, like, I actually made a Facebook profile because um, I deleted it while I was really drunk a long time ago. Um, uh, and, um, like, I literally made this Facebook profile. I didn't upload any images of me or anything. I just put in, like, my name, my date of birth, and nothing else. And, like, right away it was like, bang, these are all the people you know. Like, right away, recommended friends, it's, like, everyone I know, and it's, you know, it, it, it almost seems like Facebook was kind of like that, like, oh, yeah, we're waiting for a guy with this name born on this day, he used to have an account, and he's still talked about by all these people, so. Yeah. But then, is that, I mean, I guess, maybe not necessarily, just from your own perspective, mm-hmm. like, is that ethical? Like, is it okay for a company to build a profile on you, especially imagine someone who has never had a Facebook account, never mm-hmm. had any of this social media um, is it okay for them to build a profile on someone who is not ever engaged or consented to engage with their platform? I mean, personally, I don't think so. But I, I also do wonder how they don't do it to some extent. That a lot of this gets created just by proxy of other people using their service. Mm-hmm. That a lot of this isn't even intentional on their part. That they have these sort of machine learning systems that are just built to find people you know. Um, and they're just really, really good at it. Mm. Um, and because you're just like this hole in the network, there's this big network and you get inserted in there and they just have some rudimentary data about them you've given to that the rest of the system just slots you in. Um, and so I, I do think it is that like if they can avoid using it until you're part of the like, service and just sort of section that off. But I, I honestly actually not sure how, well, how they would go about not having this data on you just because of, I think, yeah, to some extent data protection isn't just an individual issue. It's a kind of collective issue. That even data you think is just about you is also about other people, and that I think like so we've got, we've got GDPR now, the General Data Protection Regulation that you brought in, that gives you sort of more personal control over your data. Like subject, you can do a subject access request, ask for what they know about you. Mm. But I actually think that's not the best way to think about data, because data is to some extent one only useful in aggregate when you bring a lot of people's data together, mm. and two often revealing about people that aren't yourself. So thinking about just your individual data is not the best way to think about it. I think we need to think about like collective data protection. Mm-hmm. In terms of like the political system itself, you know, we touched on this already yeah, yeah, to yeah. do with politics is kind of well, advertising and politics seem to have to crossed over somewhat now. And with the ability of campaigns to just like to use all this data to to target messages. What does that mean for the future of our politics, do you think? I mean, so, I, I, I think there are actually, like, I'm going to start with what I think are the good parts of this, because mm. there are actually, I think, some good sides to this sort of being able to target people. Mm. Because, uh, say you're, a, you, you're in a coastal town, and what you really, really care about is people's fishing policy. You really care about what the Labour Party or the Conservative Party or the Lib Dem records are going to do about fishing, mm. and that's all you're really going to vote on, you're a single issue voter, then when they're targeting, they can just tell you about that policy, that you feel informed about the things you care about. You don't have to wade through a load of things that you have no interest in just mm. to get to the one thing you want, that they can, you can feel more informed, not less informed. And I don't think that's wrong at all, mm. and I think that there are actually like pluses on there. But the other side of that is that they can promise things, like all things to all people, that say you want one fishing policy, but someone who's very environmentally concerned, like activist, can also be promised the opposite policy. Say that they might say, oh, we're going to let everyone fish all out, like now we've left the EU, we're going to just out- fish out the North Sea, basically. Mm. And they can tell someone else, no, we're going we're gonna to completely restrict it, we're going to create these safe places. And it's impossible for people to tell what their actual policy is. Right. Um, and then to some extent that the government, say the party that does this, the party that has access to these tools, gets elected, and then they have to pick what they're going to do they either implement one policy or the other, um, and whoever whoever doesn't get their policy implemented will feel really betrayed by that, mm. and so that might and that will undermine democracy even more than it already is. I think that's mm. one big issue, um, and I think there are ways around that. That Facebook, Twitter, the other platforms are creating um, 
they've got political advert political advertising libraries mm. i don't know if you've seen this if you if you try and run a political like an advert to do with politics or any big social issue you have to tell them where you live you have to give them your like contact details and it all gets posted on this big like archive and we can see all of this stuff and so to some extent civil society groups like us like others can troll through all this and find mm. out where there are contradictions so i think that isn't actually as big of an issue but yeah, I think just the mess, the messaging, being able to overwhelm other parties with your messaging. But I don't think that's as big an issue in the UK because we have big spending limits. For the European elections coming up, the spending limit is only 2.4 million per party. And that sounds like a lot of money, but just the free posts you get from everyone in taking up a load of that money, they can't actually spend very much on online advertising. Right. The, the real issue is in other countries, say America, where there are just no limits. Like one Senate race in say Texas, has more money spent on it than the entire of the UK is like massive general elections. And so I think wow. that the UK is actually probably safer from this just because there are spending limits. There's only so much parties can do. They can get really tricky, but ultimately a lot of the influence that the Labour Party has is not from its analytics software, but just from its massive organic supporter base. Mm. And I think if it's just a lot of people organically sharing your content, sort of organically targeting, if they talk to their friends and family about what they know that they, they're interested in, they tell them the policies they know they're interested in, that's not bad for democracy, that's better engagement. So yeah. I think that we're actually okay, but the other countries that don't have our, like, we actually have really good, like, our electoral commission, our ICO, are actually really good at monitoring political campaigns. So mm. I think we're okay, but it's going to be much more dangerous in America, which is already becoming quite polarised and radicalised. And, like, I mean, <clears throat> the idea of organic, sort of, the social media is an entirely organic thing, that if, if the, when there are spending limits, like, then stuff only gets reposted if people actually like it and repost it. Mm -hmm. um, is there not still some potential for abuse there, especially because, like, you know, te as technology improves, we are getting better at spotting, like, just literal mm -hmm. bots, you know, like, yeah. accounts that are just not a person. It's just a program on some computer somewhere that's pushing this or that or doing this. Mm -hmm. um, is there not a movement from sort of let's say bad actors from people who have a you know specific um sort of manipulative intent mm -hmm. um that is crossing some of the lines that they can um sort of use that same thing that if you can for example build a sort of community of people i think a really obvious one would be conspiracy theorists like you know you look at flat earth you look mm -hmm. at anti-vaxxers you look at holocaust denial you look at all of this, if you can build in a space that same kind of organic community of people who all support one thing, and then you can sort of put out something, and you don't need the bots, your sort of organic little community of conspiracy theorists will spread it for you. You, you know, it's you still have a kind of avenue for disinformation there, mm -hmm. and is it seems to me that there's just no way to regulate that because you're not even. Because it's not, you're not really actually breaking any rules. You've just got a group of people in an online space who have some very funny and very bad ideas, and they're just following all the rules and sharing their bad ideas. Mm -hmm. Is there any sort of way we can counter that? Yeah, that, I mean, that is, I think that is one of the, the toughest questions. I think that is mm. one that is going to become a major issue. I mean, the anti-vaxxer stuff has already seen like an uptick in measles in mm. lots of different countries. Um, to some extent promoted by certain political parties, say the Republicans in the US or the Five Star Movement in Italy. Uh, mm. I, yeah, again, this is one that, like, I'm not working on this personally, but another person, Alex Kradomsky Jones at Demos, is looking more at conspiracy theories and what we can do about mm. them. Uh, and to some extent, it's so, like seeing how it spreads and trying to catch it early, that, like, if you can get preemptive fact checking, but I think a lot of people believe cons believe like so there are some people who really like a hardcore people pushing it but some people just believe it because it's just what comes up on their timelines mm. um i think this is this is where it becomes a bit of a difficult free speech issue because the platforms may have to decide that say at, like anti-vax i think the anti-vax stuff is the most obvious one. i think the flat earth stuff it's kind of like who really cares like yeah, maybe you're wrong but you're really wrong effective. you're wrong and it doesn't matter yeah. but with the anti-vax stuff it's like actively dangerous I think that is, like, when I was talking earlier about incitement to violence, mm -hmm. even though it's not quite the same kind of thing, you can imagine, like, an anti-vaxxer as a sort of an active harm to society. And you might say that, um, I know the, the, the platforms just shouldn't, like, uh, like, maybe they should allow you to share it, but they shouldn't, like, boost it. They shouldn't, like, what's the word? 
Like, sh- like shadow banning it. You know, yeah. Like shadow banning, so yeah. You're grey boxing, like preventing it from sort of becoming trending. Or yeah, yeah. So that it doesn't appear on these like amplification things. Like on YouTube's recommendations and videos. Yeah. To say that it, it can't appear on there. If you send it to your friend or you directly send a message to your friend, then like to some extent you probably shouldn't stop that. That's a bit of an overreach. Yeah. But then it just can't get amplified through any of the normal channels these platforms have. <laughs> and that will probably choke it of enough life for it to become kind of irrelevant. Although, I think, to some extent, these are also... Uh, it goes back to the underlying mistrust of authority. Mm-hmm. The, the reason why anti-vax can take hold is because people don't really trust a lot of the people, that, like the experts, telling them that it isn't true. Mm. Um, and I think that's, a, again, a much more deep-seated issue around a feeling of being left behind by the establishment, a feeling of like governments not really taking their issue seriously. And so when the experts, like the doctors, say, oh, this isn't true, they're like, well, why should we believe you? Like, what have you ever done for us, kind of thing. Hmm. Hmm. Um, and so, like, within sort of the online space generally, I think we've seen a lot of radicalization. And this happens, I think, the two most obvious groups are uh, radical Islamist terrorist groups and the far right. Um, and you see with, obviously... You know, a quite surprising amount of people who went to join the um, to join Daesh in Syria, oh. um, thanks in part to a very successful, if like, you know, incredibly disgusting and offensive mm-hmm. social media campaign by them. But then also you see with people like the Christchurch shooter, and with um, uh, recently there was a synagogue shooting. Oh in yeah, in the um, USA, in California. Yeah, yeah in California, and. Um, and you know, with 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 the potential for the internet to motivate people, for people to mostly through just seeing stuff on the internet, mm-hmm. become motivated to go and do these crazy things, is is um, in a way there is an argument there that we do need a heavier hand because this is this is a very direct thing. This is this is different to just um, uh, sort of people losing trust this is people going out and killing one another um is is that how how do you do any research into that as an issue we haven't like say take the alt the alt-right groups we haven't done as much into that well jamie has uh, i don't demos itself hasn't as much gone into like these communities but i, I also think some of the issue around this is just that it's more like people are getting radicalized online mm-hmm. but there were there were shooters before there have been shooters forever mm-hmm. a lot of it is just that we're much more aware of these things happening and we can much more easily trace trace the lines. Um, I think, yeah, okay, particularly with the with the synagogue shooter and with the Christchurch shooter, which both came from 8chan, mm. I think that, they, again, yeah, there are, like, these, like, are very dangerous areas. But with, with these Islamic stuff, they've actually got quite good at shutting that down. But it's actually quite easy to identify, like, I, like, ISIS content, mm. um, and that they have managed to, so that when it goes up, it goes down almost immediately, mm-hmm. um, and it doesn't really break through anymore. And a lot of the issues that came from that were from the early days of social media back in 2013, 2014, where they weren't paying much attention. And now that governments and the platforms are looking at that, they can sense that content. Uh, hmm. For a, heavy, a heavier hand? Well, I yeah. guess, I think the thing is, it's slightly convenient with sort of ISIS, which is that it's technically at least they consider themselves like a country yeah. it's an internationally registered terrorist organization mm-hmm. like you can very easily just be like you can't have anything posted by these guys on your yeah, site yeah. you know and that no one no one really stands up and say like oh you're violating their freedom of speech you know nobody does that but then you could kind of make the same argument well if you're motivating people to go and shoot other people mm-hmm. you're a terrorist organization so in that sense, you could look at somewhere like 8chan or even 4chan or um, even parts of Reddit and yeah. be like, um, okay, well, this is terrorism, you know? And so we can use the same sort of, you know, purview, the same sort of powers yeah. that we would have in regards to, say, Al-Qaeda-related content or, mm-hmm. you know, Daesh-related content to take all of this down and have all of this be unaccessible. Yeah, I, I think that's true. Uh, yeah, I guess what I was trying to say is I don't think we need new frameworks for any of this. Mm. I think that the existing frameworks in place for for dealing with terrorism, for dealing with uh, sort of uh, like in people planning to commit murders, they already exist. Mm-hmm. I think some of it's just down to enforcement. It's that 
So uh, we did another piece of research on looking at sort of the police, like policing online. And a lot of it is just that the police don't have the technical capacity for this at the moment. Mm -hmm. the, the, tradition, the traditional person who becomes a police officer is a generalist and someone who has been taught to, you know, do the streets, do all that kind of stuff. Yeah. But they don't have the coding skills. They don't, they're often much older and they don't really understand these online environments. And so I think to some extent the solution isn't, yeah, more powers or a, or a harder approach. It's just... I guess upskilling the existing people we already have that we're a bit like we've had a lot of police cuts in the last few years that we don't really they don't really have the capacity to deal with these problems I think they're very aware that these kind of online spaces exist and they want to have people monitoring them have people looking for this kind of content they're just unable to um, so I think upskilling maybe getting like you know bringing in like white hat hackers into the police like sort of that could be a, a, one way to make them much more effective so I think yeah. that that is more the policy like route I would go down rather than trying to beef up powers even more. It's tough again though because it's like how much police presence do you actually want in these communities in the mm -hmm. same way that too much police presence on the floor is just like in real world streets it's just a bit kind of like terrifying and oppressive. You know, you want to be able to walk about feel like you can go about your day to day business without the police watching you. And similarly, I think part of what makes the internet a great place for, for communication, for exploring ideas, is the idea that nobody is going to be following you up on it. I, I, I guess that's kind of true, but like people are definitely watching you on the internet. Like I guess that's the whole thing about this targeting about you being followed around the internet, that most things you post are being scraped by multiple different like algorithms. Oh, like yeah. if, if Google can find anything, if Google, like it becomes, if you come up in Google search results, that means Google has scraped the website it was on and looked at it. Like then maybe there's no like person's eyes on it, but most content online is already being consumed by lots of different actors. And uh, so say maybe it's a private space, so a private WhatsApp group, you might feel like, oh, no one's watching me. But if you're posting something on Reddit, like by definition, loads of people are watching you. Mm -hmm. um, and I think, I, I think a lot more people would be reassured. Like, okay, so some people might feel that they can't say certain things in public anymore, and they might feel that they need to go to private groups. But that might be a good thing if the kind of thing they're saying is the kind of thing that they might feel the police might shut down. Sure. But... Sure. I guess a lot of this is in the in the Western context, where especially in the UK, like people trust the police in the UK pretty much more than anywhere else. And so, if we're looking at like UK specific online groups, like a Facebook group, people might not mind that there's a PCSO in your local community Facebook group. They might be like, "Oh, that that feels alright." That if yeah. people get into get into like fights in the comments, that there's a PCSO to just like you know gently remind them <laughs> to like. Funny idea that. Yeah. But I, I think that yeah, the more difficult stuff is where you take a sub-Saharan African country that has like a fairly authoritarian state and people don't trust the police at all mm. and so it might shut shut down like public communication so it is a very fine a fine line to take I think in the UK it's perfectly fine to say like the police are looking at this kind of stuff but they're not they're not gonna do anything about it unless you're doing things that are genuinely illegal and if people who are if people are a bit on on the borderline and they take it to private groups okay but that's still like definitely helps prevent the spread of dangerous content. Mm. Um, but in a more international context, I, I agree it is a much more difficult issue. Are there any kind of interesting or worrying trends that you've seen in, say, third world countries or just places that, say, the average British listener might not know or talk anything about? Mm. I, I think one of the interesting things is the prevalence of just shutting down the internet altogether. Mm. The, in, in Sri Lanka, after the, uh, the shooting a few weeks ago in the, in the Catholic Church, they just turned the internet off, basically. They just shut down all these like social networking platforms. And people people can communicate with their friends and family. And that often this is the approach being taken in the Middle East or like even even by well intentioned governments that actually just want to help their people. They're just taking a really heavy handed approach where they're just like, okay, the internet causing some bad things, we're just gonna turn it off, just take it completely offline. Mm. And I think that is a much more worrying trend. Um, and Russia, for instance, a week ago has announced that it's it's got a yeah, it's found a way to like sever its internet off from the rest of the world to so, like have its, ago, yeah so have its own just like intranet just for Russia yeah. and that is a so I think that there's the Great Firewall of China where they have a sort of separate internet to some extent and so I think you might start seeing states sort of closing like either turning their internets off just completely not allowing their citizens to communicate at all online yeah. because that is the one thing they definitely can do because we think of the the internet as this sort of big thing out in the world, but it's actually just a collection of cables and wires and computers in big boxes somewhere. That's what the internet really is. And the state can very much just turn those off or like section those off. And so I think that's the, the most worrying trend is just going straight for the infrastructure. Not, not like, because the people in the West, like to some extent, the states 
the reason why we have some of these problems is because the state is very reluctant to interfere online, which I think is quite good. They're taking a quite cautious approach there, seeing how it goes. But much more authoritarian countries just willing to just done. Like, it's just too much of an issue. We're just not going to let you have any of it. Mm. Yeah, I think I was reading earlier, there's an online essay by a woman called Renee DeResta, research, an American researcher. Are you familiar with her? Oh, yeah. So she um, kind of yeah, looked at disinformation around the, uh, the election campaign. And she was really talking about oh, one of the things in this essay about it may be the commitment to sort of liberalism and mm-hmm. free spread of ideas that may come to bite Western nations in the arse at the moment because of that reluctance to just turn off the internet in these danger. Now, it's a, it's a scary thought to think because I think our commitment to, to free speech and to open information and to open democracy is part of what makes our societies valuable and useful to live in as human beings. Um, yeah, it's... Again, thinking out loud there. Um, I like, it's kind of, I mean, in a way, you can always take the perspective that what we're really looking at is just a sort of, it's it's the same social issues. Mm-hmm. Yeah, like, th- th- there was, there was a Holocaust denial before, like, 4chan. Mm-hmm. You know, there was, uh, you know, Islamist terrorism before Al-Qaeda. There was... Mm-hmm. Like, you know, <clears throat> there were, you know, governments spying on their people way before, you know, anyone had a mobile phone. Mm-hmm. So, in a way, like, would you, would, you, would you give credence to this sort of view that what we're actually looking at might just be a sort of, inter- an, you know, the internet amplifies everything. It amplifies everyone's voice. It makes what you say mm-hmm. available to the entire world to see instead of just the room that you're in. Mm-hmm. Are we, is it just... An, amplification really that is the problem that, that you can take any message and amplify it yeah well i, I think that, i think that's true it is more a quantitative difference than a qualitative difference that it is an issue of scale and of speed and of connection of reach mm-hmm. but i don't necessarily think that's like it's like say if someone pokes if someone like pokes you in the face it's mm-hmm. completely fine if someone then does that a hundred times faster in terms of heavier you're suddenly knocked out but mm-hmm. like that that speed and scale does make a sort of significant it, it crosses a threshold into it becoming much more concerning but actually, I think this is one of the interesting things that we've kind of seen and like when I'm doing stuff on like AI it also comes up that these new technologies to some extent shine a light on things that were kind of implicit in society that because everyone sees technology as this new shiny thing they think about it way more critically that they are like feeling like they're engaging with a new idea when it is in fact just this old thing again but in a different light and that makes them see the issues that were already there the underlying racism the underlying conspiracy thinking the underlying like the spread of terrorism or for instance bias in like when like looking at the ai stuff it's the disc- discrimination in hiring that when it's a person doing it no one really thinks too hard about it but when there's an algorithm and you can see the exact amount of bias then suddenly you it comes much to the forefront and so i think technology to some extent is just a good lens at looking at existing social issues but clarifying them bringing them to the front and making us like actually deal with them because they're so big mm. are you positive about the future uh what, what, which aspect of the future? So, <laughs> as in, so, do you think technology will enable us to work through some of the kind of big social issues that we have discussed? Or is it more likely to exacerbate the conflicts that we see? Um, yeah, I mean, my view is the future will be more extreme, but I don't right. know in which extreme it will be. Because I, I, this is, I guess, one of the things I think about a lot is that there are lots of different underlying trends going on. That there's this whole stream of like online disinformation of AI, online targeting, and the whole digital technology sphere. But at the same time, there's biotech going on. You know, you know CRISPR, mm-hmm. the, the development of being able to do, doing gene editing. There've already been like cases in China of a doctor like genetically like en- editing embryos and like having genes like that. And then there's climate change and all this stuff going on at the same time. There's antibiotic resistance, quantum computing, a whole nother field, mm. and it's all running alongside each other. And it's just am- they're all amplifying each other. Mm. And so. I think the future will just be more extreme, but I think it could be extremely good as well as extremely bad. That there is there is a, there is a world where we work out how to debias algorithms, we work out how to build like systems that are really really well coordinated, that actually give us exactly what we want, that mm. can help us solve some of the scarcity issues because we can allocate resources really well, that we have much nicer air because we're no longer all driving petrol cars, and that there is a future where it goes really really well, but there is a future also that 
things go really, really badly, where like climate change causes mass migration that amplifies the issues around like um, social unrest in countries that we can't solve the bias problem, we can't solve the targeting problem, that attack overtakes defense, and that we are overwhelmed. Mm. And so I guess I am somewhat optimistic in that I think there there is a possible like future where humanity does way better than it's ever done before by like a significant a significant margin that everyone in the world has a quite good life and we have made massive strides mm. like in like poverty around the world has gone down i think a couple billion in the last 40 like in the last 40 years mm. so we have made massive steps the world is a, lot, is a lot better than it used to be right so i don't know i am i guess i am kind of optimistic but i'm very uh I think we should be very cautious. A cautious <laughs> optimism. Yeah. yeah, so I guess one of the things that I find myself worrying about is um, that with kind of targeted advertising and social media and also just the technology we have like Amazon that can give you anything on your door pretty much the next day when you want it, mm-hmm. people are getting more and more used to having or at least being promised what they want and what will solve their problems. I mean, that's kind of been the case for advertising for the last 100 years, but it seems like it's just exacerbated that trend now. Like you can use a data analytics to find out exactly what I want at 9 a.m. on a Friday morning and offer that to me. And if you can actually give that to me, then over time that may create a kind of mental state in which I'm used to getting what I want all the time. (laughs) And I think, I wonder if this is part of kind of the trend of polarization that we see going on in our in our politics and in our cultural life that people are less and less inclined to disagreement and to discussion things with each other because the technology itself promises them absolutely what they want the resolution to their yeah. issues um and so yeah polarization is this big thing that i'm thinking about a lot um what are your thoughts on that yeah, I guess I think that is that is true to some extent. I think one aspect of that is the way that the private and public sector relate. That a lot of what you're saying there is true. Of, it's true of Amazon. It's true of Facebook. It's true of a lot of a lot of private companies. But the public sector hasn't been able to keep up. I think one of the reasons why there has been a sort of decline in trust in the government, a decline in like faith in them, like the establishment getting people what they want, is because the public sector hasn't kept up. It doesn't deliver what you want. Like we still have a fairly broken welfare system. We still have. Felt like the train, the trains, for instance, are a bit of a mess. Yeah, yeah. and so that there is <clears throat> that the government used to be like in the post-war era, the government was this leading figure. It was quite revolutionary. It was quite transformative, mm. and so people had a lot of faith in society, a lot of faith in institutions, um, and that has degraded over time. And so I think that's that's one aspect of that. I think yeah, the other with polarization, it is you get what you want, and you can talk to other people who agree with you. I think right. I think to me the polarization is more being able to talk to people who you agree with and not needing to discuss with... So, you know, historically, you would talk with people who lived in your local community because they were the only people you could communicate with. Mm. And so if you were the one person who had a quite extreme view, then you just kept that to yourself, or you wrote, like, a, a diary, or you maybe sent letters to, the like, a newspaper and they never get published. Mm. But now you can have a group where you, fee- you meet other people who agree with you, and you can all reinforce each other and build up a kind of... you Like, what's the word? You can feel validated in that belief. Mm. So I think... There has been a lot, like a lot of what we see in polarization is like there were these underlying extreme beliefs on both sides, but they weren't validated and they weren't able to be organized. And I think what we're seeing is more the organization of extreme beliefs. Mm. That I think I think throughout history we can see if we look, look at people's diaries, we can see people who had very out there beliefs, but that now they can form organizations, they can have coordinated action. I think that coordination of polarization is more the case. Mm. But it doesn't even have to be extreme beliefs. It can even be people just like online vegetarians who oh. go in like vegetarian networks. And then because all of a sudden now you're plugged into a million living, breathing, memeing vegetarians, mm-hmm. you think that your way of life is the only way of life. <laughs> okay. And like, so that sort of process of validation is a very interesting, um, uh, actually it's a video by a YouTuber called CGP Grey, but it's him <laughs> summing up a theory by, I cannot exactly remember who, but it's it's based on the idea that if you, you can think of sort of thoughts in a way as being a little bit similar to diseases. Mm-hmm. In fact, you, you pass them on to other people through communication and stuff like that. And in this video, he, he makes the point that one specific emotion and kind of thought that the internet makes it very, very, very easy to pass on is um, hatred. Mm-hmm. Because when you kind of communicate that you really, really don't like something, 
you don't tend to communicate with the people or group that you hate. You tend to communicate with other people who are going to reinforce that. And so you tend to get kind of like a circle of people all exchanging and sort of reinforcing the, the attitude of hate without ever actually engaging with the group of people who it is that they're opposed to. And that becomes much, much, much easier in the online anonymous sort of social space where again, you can find validation for this or that thing that you think that is, you know, um, that, you know, in, it, you would never say out loud basically. Um, and, and that, and that, in a way I find is one of the big reasons for the polarization is that people can kind of communicate very strongly negative feelings that they have about this or that group very openly in the online space. And like, is this something that companies like Facebook and Twitter and stuff should have an interest in um, taking action against? Like as in, not in, 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 as in like, should there be some kind of way that we like identify a heart? Like, this group is starting, not necessarily to like incite violence, but we can just like see here in the same way that you, you know, there's the famous example from that, um, uh, it wasn't really a documentary, that show, the um, Brexit and Uncivil War, where the guy from, uh, not Cambridge Analytica, but the Dominic other Cummings. one. Dominic Yeah. Um, no, no, not the oh, guy right. in charge of the campaign, like one of the guys from the tech company who's oh, yeah. sort of trying to sell to him the idea of using data, it says like Facebook can tell when you're falling out of love with your spouse mm -hmm. because they obviously have a model of what everyone who's ever ended their marriage on Facebook does before. Yeah. Well, in the same way, like it shouldn't be too difficult to say, build a model of aha, like we've this group of people here mm -hmm. are, you know, they're starting to go down that kind of road of everyone reinforcing each other's like negative feelings. And do you think they could use some kind of like soft power to moderate that? Like it would be possible to sort of covertly intervene into those kind of spaces and modify the things people are saying, modify the content that's appearing to prevent that kind of phenomenon. So, yeah, to, to some extent, but like, uh, well, uh, yeah, so I think that they can, to some extent, when it's in news feeds, so it's Twitter, or you have the, the Facebook news feed, or, or Instagram, they're structured like that. Mm -hmm. But uh, one, I don't know if you've seen recently that like, they're all moving towards these more private things, that Facebook is restructuring its platform to be more focused on groups. Mm -hmm. And groups are the one area where you can't really do that. That if, if you've got like an algorithmic, ser like an algorithm serving up your newsfeed, you can say, oh, we're going to, we think that these people are at risk of becoming too in group. We can start diversifying their newsfeed, stop serving them this content, and start showing them that. But when you build an online space more and more around groups, how do you, like, it, because it would become, become really obvious if you were scrolling through a specific Facebook group and you started seeing content that didn't look like that group, that, it, like, that you, were, you were going looking for it to some extent. Mm -hmm. The algorithms can only do so much, you know, in that if you let yourself be, con not controlled, but let yourself be guided by the algorithm, then that, that works to some extent, this kind of soft power. Although even in that case, the platforms aren't really incentivized to take that kind of action. I think there would mm -hmm. need to be like outside regulation compelling them to do that. Because the, like, say take the YouTube, al YouTube algorithm for engagement, have you seen have you seen the sort of articles where you can start one video that's about football and if you just let it autoplay for 30 videos you start hitting like info wars and things like oh, that oh yeah yeah, 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 yeah. that and... you you like making things slightly more extreme at every step on a news feed or on a set of videos mm. makes you more engaged and the companies are geared around enga engagement i think to some extent the focus on engagement has been the root of a lot of these problems that their business model is about getting you to stay on their platform as much as possible. Mm. And that if there's a choice between serving you something that's kind of interesting, but kind of just more informative, like fairly vanilla middle of the road, you might stay on there, but you might just go on and do something else. Mm. But if it's suddenly getting more extreme, getting more a bit like intense, then you feel more like people just stay on there longer. And that's like an emergent like property of just optimizing for engagement. Mm. So I think there are two issues there. One, that the more and more focus toward groups and private groups makes that a very difficult solution to implement. And that too, even if the even if people within the platforms wanted to, and I do think there are a lot of people within these companies who genuinely want to try and solve this problem, the kind of market incentives around engagement, around getting people to stay on your platform, to click things, is completely counter to that. And that if one platform decides to try and take a stand and try and fix things, they might just end up losing lots of money and going out of business and being replaced by someone who isn't willing to do that. Oh. I think that leads into an interesting point, which is like, 
how much does the fact that these online spaces are ultimately privately owned and are ultimately run for a profit factor into sort of the problems that seem emergent or seem inherent in these online spaces? Like, and, you know, I think you obviously put forward the, one of the most obvious issues, which is that <clears throat> engagement is king. Mm -hmm. More engagement, more money. The site that has the best engagement mm -hmm. out competes the others. So in that way, um, you know, as you said, like they're kind of disincentivized to do anything that might have a positive overall effect, but would negatively affect this engagement. Mm -hmm. And then also sort of as a tangent to that, um, YouTube, for example, is actually a bit of a monopoly because there isn't really any other video hosting site. Like all every other video hosting site either hosts one niche kind of video that is either not allowed or just like not well formatted for YouTube. So, you know, um, I mean, obviously stuff that's banned on YouTube, like politically controversial stuff, you have live leak and then pornography, you have you know, the whole point. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. But, um, you know, video, YouTube does kind of exist in a vacuum. And so, cause nothing's ever going to be able to compete with YouTube because all the videos are already on YouTube. Yeah. So how does that sort of affect, affect the problem that these, these companies own what is most people think of as kind of being public space? Yeah, I think, I think that is difficult because that arises from like economies of scale and like network effects that why are you on Facebook? You're on Facebook because everyone's on Facebook. Yeah. But there, that's the only reason you really go there. Um, I think it's, it's interesting to think about the comparison to YouTube and Facebook versus say email because email is just like a, it's an open protocol. When you send an email from one person to another, say you're on Outlook and I'm on Gmail, you can still send an email between us. There's no way to monopolize email because it's all built on a sort of shared protocol. And so that you don't get these issues because you can have a network where everyone is connected, but without one person controlling the network or being in charge. Mm -hmm. So I think that that is that is one area that like I think the state could have done something to some extent. That if video sharing was based on a, a common protocol where YouTube was just one interface to this common like video accessing ser like service, mm -hmm. or that Facebook like I know you've heard of things like Mastodon, like de like decentralized social networks where there's a kind of open protocol and you have mm -hmm. your kind of browser to to this thing but when you're seeing content it's just being served up from you to another person and that you have your own interface to it so i think that it, that is one issue and i think but yeah getting onto the public spaces issue i think it, yeah it's not democratically accountable ultimately these companies are accountable to their shareholders um and also to the idiosyncrasies of the people who are in charge mm. that to some extent like facebook is mark zuckerberg's private kingdom and the idiosyncras idiosyncrasies of a nerdy guy from Harvard shape a lot of the decisions that get made, yeah. um, mm. which is a, kind of interesting. And I, I, I think this is kind of a difficult issue though, because you want democratic accountability. You want, say, everyone on Facebook to have a say in how Facebook is run. But this runs up against the kind of the structure of our world as it exists now. That we are split up into lots of countries. That we're in the United Kingdom or America or Euro or different parts of Europe or the rest of the world. But these companies cut across all of those, and so. Like, what's the public alternative? Is it is it a state book? Is it that everyone in the UK has their own platform? <laughs> but that's not really one not very useful. And two puts a set like a separate problem of the, the government oversight. And yeah. so it's, I mean, my ideal solution would be a sort of an open like an open protocol run by like an international agency. Yeah. I mean, say say that like the UN like I want to call it a UN social media institution where they would they would run this kind of central thing that coordinated everyone that was accountable to some extent to maybe not to the people but at least to every country and every country had a say in how it was run um mm. but yeah I, I do think there is a, a a tension there between the way that we organize government and the way that we want international institutions to be democratically accountable sure because i, I mean you've got the european elections coming up and those are one sort of international like democratic exercise and they have abysmal turnout rates because people feel very distant from them yeah. And so I don't know how you make people feel connected, even if they had a vote on Facebook and a vote on how Facebook did things. How do you make them feel connected to that decision when it's you and three billion other people getting a decision? Is it worth my taking yeah. this, however long it would take to educate me on this issue? Yeah. To see, see all the, see all the, you know, the, the candidates for Facebook's ruling board or whatever. Like, yeah. And, it, and if you do that to every platform and every part of the online space, then you've got like an election every day for something different and people will just turn off. And it will get the same problem you have in like modern politics. This is one of the big problems, right? We're like a species that was optimized for groups of about 150 people, and now we're supposedly living in a global, yeah, global seven billion people all plugged into each other. Mm -hmm. And it's like 
there reaches a point where you kind of just become numb to it. Mm -hmm. Um, so we've got about five minutes left. Okay. So I think we're just going to go like, a final question that we'd like to ask all of our guests is what do you think is one thing that all people and especially kind of young people, listeners, should know about the world and the future towards it, which it's heading? I mean, okay, so I think this is to do with the like AI automation stuff. Mm. The ONS came out quite recently with its stats on like automation figures and what, it, what kind of jobs it thinks will get automated or not. Um, and it... I thought it was a bit dubious, to be honest, that their modeling is not great. But to think about, think about your, like, if you're a young person, think about what career you're going to choose in, in that kind of context, that a lot of my friends are becoming lawyers or doctors. Mm. But if you look at the AI systems being deployed already, the gen genomic systems being deployed already in, like, healthcare, that becoming a highly trained doctor is probably not the way to go. That a lot of the difficulties, like, these automated systems are having at the moment is around empathy about human connection that I think those will be the really valuable skills in the future. Mm. The kind of people who can en engage with other humans in a very human way, mm. have very good social skills, not being extremely knowledgeable, like experts, like qualified experts. So don't become a lawyer, don't become a doctor. Get really just good at talking to other people, like being mm. empathetic, mm. because that's the comparative advantage you have over the robots for the next 30 or 40 years. Mm. Yeah, I mean, I think that's really part of the vision of why we'd like to start the podcast and actually have conversations with people because in an era where more and more of our interaction can be done online mm -hmm. through text it's so important and actually essential to preserve that that kind of human thing yeah. that we have cool yeah definitely some, some interesting and probably quite good advice and i'm <laughs> certain in sort of 10 or 20 years you may even be able to say i told you so <laughs> <laughs> I hope so. right well um Elliot from Demos, thank you very much for coming on the podcast. It's been a real pleasure to have you on. Yeah, thank you. It's been great. Yeah, awesome. Cheers. Uh, see you guys in the next episode, Technosocial. <laughs>